Okay, this is video six on the students of Confucius. And one reason why I want to uh, have a separate video just to talk about student, uh, Confucius's students is that this really is a, uh, a philosophical dialogue that we're reading, or perhaps a collection of very short dialogues. Um, and so the interaction between the characters is very important. The other thing is uh, Confucianism is a tradition um, uh, rather than b simply being the work of a single great philosopher. And so part of understanding it requires you to understand a little bit, at least, of um, the tradition uh, of scholarship and advice to rulers that, the, uh, that, that Confucius inaugurated. Um, so here's a contemporary painting, oil painting, of Confucius with uh, Zi Lu and Yan Wei. Um, and I should say that I'm still working on uh, pronunciation. I'm learning, because I, I teach multiple traditions. Uh, I'm still learning some of the finer details of the cultural background. So I'm... I don't take my pronunciation as uh, uh, absolutely correct. In any case, um, here's and so this is this is a common way though to see Confucius and his disciples portrayed, you know, in conversation. Um, so it's worth talking a bit about uh, philosophical dialogues in general, right? All, I mentioned in the intro videos that all of the readings we're doing in this course are dialogues. Um, and as I said previously, uh, a philosophical dialogue is a literary genre where uh, philosophical ideas and arguments are presented in the form of a discussion between characters. And this is actually a, a, a form of writing, a genre of writing that you see uh, developing more or less independently all over the world. Uh, I mentioned previously that philosophy is a natural human activity, and certain forms of expression for it also seem to crop up fairly naturally. In general, right, I th the idea with dialogue is that character and setting are meant to complement the argument. Um, argument is crucial in philosophy. Uh, it, it is a, a core feature of philosophy. Um, and, but genre, the genres that, the, the literary genres that philosophy gets presented in um, bring out different aspects of argument. And so here, in particular with dialogues, um, the characters and the setting are, are most meant to highlight um, the ideas in the dialogue. So, for instance, Confucius is not just uh, someone telling you things about how to live. He is a character who embodies uh, virtue, how to live, right? Um, and his relationship with his students embodies a lot of what he thinks um, a teacher-student relationship should be. So that gets to another point, um, that uh, we're dealing with an example of a philosophical dialogue here, and uh, it's a specific subtype of philosophical dialogue. It's a teacher-pupil dialogue. Um, and this is a kind of dialogue that presents itself as a conversation between a teacher and one or more students. And this is something that, again, crops up, seems to develop independently all over the world. Um, and I think some of that is just, um, as writing is emerging, in society, you see societies moving from oral to written traditions. And so what, what's the first thing you want to do? You want to write down the sayings of your wise teacher um, and perhaps record his interactions or her interactions in some cases. And so that is, uh, it's just sort of a natural way to present things. And so we see dialogue, uh, 
teacher-pupil dialogues being written in every philosophical tradition, and we also see people playing around with uh, the conventions of the teacher-pupil dialogue, and we'll see that especially when we get to Plato. All right, so I want to talk about some of the people that Confucius has been talking with, um, and I think one of the most important is Yan Wei. So uh, here's a portrait of him. Uh, from uh, the Yuan dynasty, which is uh, 13th, 14th centuries. Um, this is an old tradition, right? So this is already uh, over like uh, um, 1,500 years, uh, one, 1,500 years after Confucius, and people are drawing what they imagine Confucius and his students look like. Okay. Um, so... To get a sense of uh, what Yan Wei is, I, just, I think that the easiest thing to do, what Yan Wei is like, is just to go and read some of the passages that he appears in. So this is the first one he appears in. It's really a brilliant passage. It's dense. There's a lot of stuff here. The master said, I can talk all day long with Yan Wei without him once disagreeing with me. In this way, it se he seems stupid. Yet when we retire and I observe his private behavior, I see that he is in fact worthy to serve as an illustration of what I have taught. He is not stupid at all. And here's another one like that. Um, the master said to Zigong, Who is better, you or Yan Wei? Zigong answered, How dare I even think of comparing myself to Wei? Wei learns one thing and thereby understands ten. I learn one thing and thereby understand two. The master said, no, you're not as good as Wei. Neither of us are as good as Wei. So, one thing that we learn right away from these is that Yan Wei was Confucius's favorite student, right? Um, uh, uh, not just a favorite student, but he a the best student. And we also see for Confu what constitutes being a good student for Confucius, right? You might think that a good student is one who asks you a lot of questions or pushes you in some way, certainly in uh, Western teaching. Um, getting pushback from students is a sign that uh, the, the students are paying attention, getting, you know, getting, uh, having disagreements and questioning. Um, but that's not what Confucius is interested in. He says, oh, well, he doesn't do that. And maybe he'd seem smart if he, if Yan Wei did that. But the thing that I see that really lets me know that he's smart is that he is able to apply what he learns. And again, I just want to emphasize that for T Confucius, Confucius is a pragmatist in the simple sense that for Confucius, knowing is doing. If you know it, you can do it. Um, and uh, the other thing that we see with uh, Z, uh, Yan Wei here is that he can generalize better, right? He, he gets told one thing and thereby understands 10. So Yan Wei was a good student, um, and he exemplified a lot of things about what it means to be a good student for Confucius. Then there's also this. The Duke, Duke I asked, who among your disciples might be said to love learning? Duke I was the nominal ruler of the uh, province of Lu. Um, so like I had mentioned before, the Zhou Empire had, was in decline. And so the real power was no longer with the official family. The real power was with a group of mobsters in this province known as the Three Families. And uh, so here Confucius is talking with someone who uh, is the titular head. He's supposed to be in charge, but he's not really in charge. A bunch of mobsters are. Well, in any case, Confucius answers, There was one named Yan Wei who loved learning. He never misdirected his anger and never made the same mistake twice. Unfortunately, his allotted lifespan was short and he passed away. Now that he is gone, there are none who really love learning. At least I have yet to hear of one. So, 
That's the other thing about Yan Wei. He was Confucius's best student, but he died young. There's one more passage about Yan that I want uh, the about Wei that I want to highlight. Um, this is uh, actually I talked about this before when we were talking about ritual. Um, a lot of times you wind up circling back to the same passages again and again because they have so many layers of meaning. They're so rich that way. Um, but here, this is just more about Yan, uh, Yan Wei's relationship with his teacher, Confucius. With a great sigh, Yan Wei lamented, the more I look up at it, the higher it seems. The more I delve into it, the deeper it becomes. The it here is probably the Confucian Tao. Catching a glimpse of it before me, I then find it suddenly at my back. He is saying, man, it's hard. Learning is hard. The master is skilled at gradually leading me on step by step. He broadens me with culture and restrains me with rights. That's the part I emphasized in the last video. So that even if I wanted to give up, I could not. Having exhausted all my strength, it seems as if there's still something left looming ahead of me, though I desire to follow it. It seems like there's no way through. So, Yan Wei was devoted to learning. He was a great student. He died young. Well, let's just summarize this. So we can just, what do we need to know about, about him? Well, there's a lot, and then it's a really rich relationship and a really rich pair of characters, but we can just highlight a few things. He was Confucius's best pupil. He died young. He was loved by Confucius and the other students. Right, Zigong is also like, oh man, I, I'm not as good a student as he is. And his death affected Confucius profoundly. He was really, really sad about this. It shook his life. Um, and uh, the other thing is that uh, we see what it means to be a good student in Yan Wei. And in, in particular, that means that he shows his virtue in practice. That is, he, he shows that he knows things by applying them. Zigong, um, another half portrait here. Um, what can we say about him? We already saw him. He just was, when he was admitting that he wasn't half the pupil um, that Yan Wei was. Well, let's look at some of the things where he appears. Sometimes Confucius says very good things about Zigong. So Zigong says, to be poor without being obsequ obsequious, um, or rich without being arrogant, what would you call someone like that? The master answered, that is acceptable, but not as good as being poor yet joyful, or rich and yet loving ritual. Zigong said, an ode says, as if cut, as if polished, as if carved, as if ground, describing... Um, I don't know what they're describing making there, but it's supposed to be a metaphor for the process of educating a gentleman. Is this not what you have in mind? The master says, Zigong, you are precisely the kind of person with whom one can begin to discuss the odes. Remember, Confucius loves old books, and one of the most important one was a book of old song lyrics known as the odes. Sometimes it's called a book of poetry, but all the, all the poetry was set to music. Informed as to what has come before, you know what is yet to come. So Confucius praises Zigong. Later in the book, we see Zigong being presented as his own teacher, uh, as a teacher in his own right. So he says, a gentleman's errors are like the eclipse of the sun or the moon. When he errs, everyone notices it. But when he makes amends, everyone looks up to him. So Zigong here is saying, well, I, for our purposes, the thing we want to emphasize is that he is presenting teaching um, just as, uh, as, as uh, respectable as the teaching of his master, Confucius. So he seems like he's smart, but why, so why isn't he as smart as Yan Wei? Well, here's some things to look at. Um, so Zigong wanted, wanted to do away with the practice of sacrificing a lamb to announce the beginning of a month. 
that would be wasteful. You don't see much respect for the lives of animals here uh, in Confucius. It's but uh, they're certainly always considered valuable property. The master said, Zigong, you regret the loss of a lamb, whereas I regret the loss of a right. So Zigong made the wrong decision there. Zigong says, what I do not wish to do un others to do unto me, I also wish not to do unto others. This is, of course, the golden rule in its negative formulation. Don't do unto others as you wouldn't have them do unto you. Um, sometimes, that, sometimes that gets called the silver rule. The golden rule appears, or the silver rule, appears three times in the Analects, and it is uh, the oldest recorded, um, to my knowledge, the oldest uh, record of the golden rule being stated directly like this. And... Uh, I mean, it, it, the golden rule is an idea that crops up independently all over the world. Some other, sometimes it's stated, uh, it's not stated quite as directly, but uh, this is an early, early case of it being stated directly. So how does Confucius reply? He says, Ah, Si Gong, that's something quite beyond you. It's, he's like, yeah, you say that, but you can't do it. Right. Um, also, Zigong was given to criticizing others. The master re remarked sarcastically, "What a worthy man Zigong must be! For me, I hardly have time for this." So, Confucius really, frankly, and openly criticizes his students when they screw up, and he does that especially with Zigong. Um, so, uh, actually, this is also the subject of one of my favorite bits of uh, Confucian shade, I think of it. So, at one point, Zigong asks, Master, what do you think of me? Um, and the master replied, you are a vessel. What sort of vessel? A Hu or Leon vessel. So, the vessels here are bowls that are used in very important rituals. And uh, specifically, the Lu or Lian, Hu or Lian video uh, vessels are old-fashioned bowls used in old-fashioned rituals that are uh, really, um, you know, noble. And so it looks like Confucius is complimenting his student. But a little bit earlier in the book, he said this, the gentleman is not a vessel. So actually, he was insulting Zigong, um, sort of. He was casting shade. That's the best way to put it. Um, you can also, again, learn a lot here. So why does he say the gentleman is not a vessel? So a ritual bowl um, is something that's just used for a specific purpose. It's specialized. Um, and in fact, the kind of specialized bowl Zigong is like is... Uh, specialized for a ritual that isn't even done anymore. So Zigong seems to be too wrapped up in the past and too rigid about it. So, I mean, here's what we can say about him. He's an imperfect student. He's a foil for Yan Wei. He understands the traditional culture so much so that he's like an old-fashioned bowl. But he's too rigid and inflexible to be a gentleman, right? He is, um, he criticizes others. He's harsh. He doesn't, um, if Confucius is all about keeping a tradition alive in the present, Zigong is just the tradition being dead in the past. He's not quite there. All right. Master Yu. So there are two disciples with the title Master, Zhe, at the end. So Confucius was Kung Zhe. Um, I'd, be, I'd been pronouncing it Kong Zhe earlier, but I, I guess it's Kung, Kung Zhe, um, Master Kung. And this is, so this guy is Yu Zhe, Master Yu. The fact that he gets called Master is clearly indicates that he's important 
Um, and so it's likely that he heard Confucius's death. Right, so he probably founded his own school after Confucius's death. Um, some accounts say that he actually took over Confucius's school after Confucius died, but all the disciples left. So he wasn't really a successful su successor. Master Zheng, on the other hand, is the other one who has this title, right? Um, and he founded a school that lived on. Mencius, in particular, was trained in this school. Um, it says in uh, the back of the book that he was known for his filial piety. He also wrote, a. there's a whole book that we know at one point existed of his sayings, but that book has been lost. So he's the he is the more successful follower of Confucius, immediate follower. Let's take a look at all the kinds of things he has to say. Master Zhang said, Every day I examine myself on three counts. In my dealings with others, have I in any way failed to be dutiful? In my interactions with friends and associates, have I in any way failed to be trustworthy? Finally, have I in any way failed to repeatedly put into practice what I teach? So, like a good student, he follows his master in emphasizing practice as um, the proof of teaching. And he is always criticizing himself for the purpose of improving himself. Okay. Here's another one with Master Zhang. The master said, Master Zhang, all I can teach can be strung together on a single thread. Well, that's a weird thing to say. But uh, I guess what it means is that um, all uh, there's some kind of unifying theme in all of Confucius's teaching. Yes, sir, Master Zhang replied. After the master left, the disciples asked, what did he mean by that? And then Zhang, so after Confucius leaves, and later on will die, and Zhang will explain what he meant. All the master teaches amounts to nothing more than dutifulness tempered with understanding. And so that's actually another Confucian teaching because you get kind of one virtue moderated by another virtue. All right, the last of the disciples that I want to talk about is Mencius. Um, so he's a much later disciple. He was not uh, one of the immediate followers. He doesn't appear in the Analects, but we did read something by him. Uh, he was probably taught by the grandson of Master Zhang, and he... The thing I emphasized before is that he presents his all his ideas in argument form, and this is really the moment in the Confucian tradition where argument becomes central. And we saw the bit by him that we read was where he um, argued that all people have a heart that cannot stand to see the suffering of others. So he was carrying on a tradition of Confucian philosophizing about human nature which begins with the assumption that we all have the potential to be good. Not that we're good, but we all have the seed of goodness. We just need to nurture it. And for Mencius, the seed of goodness was very specifically compassion. Everyone if you saw a baby about to fall into a well, this is still true today, news, newspapers, videos go viral. Oh my God, there's a baby in danger. People get upset. Why is, what does that mean? It means that we all have the heart that cannot stand to see the suffering of others. And if we didn't, we wouldn't be human. That's what Mencius teaches. All right. So the last video I want to make after this one contrasts um, the Confucian school with two other schools.